Olá, esse é mais um Arqueologia em Ação, e hoje nós vamos entrevistar a mestre Jonica Morrow, dos Estados Unidos. Ela é da Universidade de Nebraska, Lincoln, e trabalha com arqueoparasitologia. Jonica, thank you very much for the interview. Thank you for having me here. Well, uh, the first question I have to you is, once you were with archaeoparasitology, could you say to us what is parasitology and archaeoparasitology? Well, um, what I do is archaeoparasitology, which um, is looking at parasites from human remains, so things like coprolites, which are desiccated feces, um, things like sediments from latrines and privies, um, and, uh, cesspits and those kinds of things. Um, as well as um, intestines that have been mummified from, well, from mummies. Um, and sometimes things like hair and other uh, sort of mummified tissues to look for the parasites that were infecting peoples of the past. Nice. And what's the importance of all that? Well, it's really important to understand the epidemiology of parasitism um, in populations of the past so that we have a better understanding of these parasites today. Um, and a, a better understanding of the evolution of these parasites over time. So when we look at um, archaeoparasitology, we're looking at a very uh, specific group of parasites that are still problematic for people today. Things like um, Ascaris lumbricoides, which is the human maw worm. Um, things like Trichuris trichuria, which is the uh, whip worm. Um, things that are still problematic in a large percentage of the populations today. So, uh, Jonica? Okay, you said about uh, the importance of these studies, but, but how can you compare uh, archaeological populations mm -hmm. with nowadays populations in these studies of parasitology? Is like the same thing of studies, the same kind of studies, the same method? Um, a little bit different methodology because we're working with older stuff, but it's the same principle. We want to understand how, uh, how prevalent these different parasites were in different populations, and then that gives us a chance to, to sort of understand what was the public health like in that population and how were these diseases being spread. So what, was the, uh, what were the epidemiological factors that were coming into play with, with these different populations? And um, not just the epidemiology, but you can also learn a lot um, by proxy through looking at parasitism. So, for example, there was a, um, a culture that lived in... Uh, Oregon in the north uh, western United States and uh, it was a site called Paisley Cave and when you looked at uh, when we looked at the coprolites which are the desiccated fecal materials from these uh, from this cave what we found were hookworms and hookworms for their life cycle they have to um, they have to start out the egg is um, the the adults are inside the intestines of a human Uh, the adults mate, the adults produce eggs, the eggs are laid and come out in the feces, uh, and then the parasite has to hatch from the egg and spend part of its life cycle in the soils. Um, and then when it goes through a couple of molting stages and when it gets to the infective stage of this uh, parasite, then the parasite will burrow into the skin of a human, so somebody walking around with like bare feet. Um, and then these parasites burrow in and uh, they go through this whole migration inside the body and they go through these other life changes until they become adulthood, uh, until they reach adulthood. And uh, then these parasites mate and lay their eggs and continue the cycle. So for this to be able to happen, these worms have to have an environment in which they are able to uh, live in the soil. And these are, uh, these are typically subtropical kinds of worms. And we were finding these in the northeastern, or north, excuse me, the uh, northwestern United States. So that tells you a lot about what was happening in pre-Clovis times, which is when these, these coprolites were dated to, um, in terms of how people were migrating into the New World. So this sort of uh, lends credence to the, uh, the idea that people were coming through a, um, a coastal route rather than going through the, um, the uh, Beringia, as, as many people have thought in the past, but we're finding more and more archaeological evidence to suggest that that's not really the... <laughs> the way or the only right. way that people were coming into the new world and and these parasites have uh, helped us to um, sort of support the hypothesis that, that people were taking coastal routes to get into the new world. 
So it's really neat that these parasites um, it, it kind of can help for more than just talking about disease and, and diseases in prehistory. So uh, in uh, archaeoparasitology research, you don't analyze just <laughs> parasites. No. <laughs> what else do you are looking at and why? Okay, um, with archaeoparasitology, there are some people who are kind of getting into it now for the first time and who get very excited about the parasites. And I, I can relate because the parasites are my favorite part. And they're very <laughs> cool. Um, but when you do these kinds of analyses, you really need to do what we call a sequential analysis. So, so you start by looking at the parasites and you also look for starch granules and phytoliths. And uh, then you go and you do further processing to look for things like pollen and dietary residues. Um, to be able to understand, you know, what were these people eating and what was eating them. And by doing this, um, it's very important to understand the parasitism, um, that you understand what the diet was like, what sort of medicinal plants people may have been um, ingesting to try to control for those parasites. And we can do this by, by doing these sequential analyses. So it's very, very important that uh, when we do these, um, or looking at copper lights or sediments or mummy intestines, you know, you don't get a chance to ever get those samples again. That's a, a one-time one sort of snapshot in, in history. And so you want to extract all the information that you can to really build a picture of diet and parasitism. Jonica, you are now on your PhD research. Mm -hmm. You're working in Mexico, is that right? Sort of. I'm working with samples from Mexico. Uh, I'd like to go to Mexico, but <laughs> actually the samples were collected in the, the 1970s. And uh, we have a lot of this material in the lab that I work in um, at the School of Natural Resources in uh, the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And um, so I've been going through these samples and, and uh, sort of sorting and getting ready to do the analysis. But what I'll be doing is looking at these, um, at these coprolites, which are these, these desiccated uh, fecal uh, samples from uh, this site in Mexico. And I'm going to be uh, examining, the, examining them for a variety of parasites. So the first thing I'll do is um, a typical archaeoparasitological analysis where I'll look for the, the worm eggs to see if there are any big endohelminths. And then after that, um, we'll continue and we'll do the, the starches and the phytoliths and the pollen analysis with those samples. But we're also going to save part of, the, um, part of the samples to be able to use for ELISA testing, which is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And what these do is um, they'll test, when we take a little bit of our sample and put them into these test kits, if, um, if a person who deposited the copper light was infected with the parasite that we're looking for with our test kit, mm -hmm. then that person would have developed antibodies in response to that parasite. And what the test kit does is test for these antibodies. Um, and ELISA test kits have been used in archaeological contexts for a variety of intestinal protozoans. So things like Entamoeba histolytica and Cyclospora um, and Cryptosporidium. And we're going to look for those three um, as well as a, a few other parasites. And then we're also going to examine um, what are called quids, which are chewed up plant materials that were, um, people would chew on them for a while and then spit them out. And they desiccate the same way that coprolites do. So we're going to take... Um, process these quids in a similar man manner to the way we process coprolites, which has never been done before. Um, quids have kind of been not really used for much in terms of looking at, uh, in an archaeological context, most people have looked at them to see what kind of fibers are, are made up, so what kind of plants people were chewing, but other than that, they haven't been used for much. And we hypothesized that you can use quids as a source material to look for um, two particular parasites that would have probably been present in this region at that point in time, but we have no, uh, no way of testing for that um, as of right now. So we're proposing a new method of um, processing these quids to try to look for Toxoplasma gondii, which causes toxoplasmosis, and Trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease. So we're going to look for these two parasites from the quids and then a number of intestinal protozoans from the um, coprolites for my dissertation. Jonica, uh, we know that human remains are not very well preserved in any environment. They're not well preserved. Even when it's well preserved, we have some, some things missing there. 
And how about parasites? It's easily preserved. If you're talking about the endo helmets, it's kind of amazing how well the parasites preserve. Um, so when we're looking at these, we're not looking for adult, you know, soft-bodied invertebrates. We're looking for the eggs that are left behind by the parasites. And many of these eggs um, have very durable sort of shells that has helped to preserve them through time. Um, some preserve better than others, so some of them are easier to find than others. Uh, things like Ascaris lumbricoides has a very durable coat, uh, preserves very, very well, especially in copper lights. And the, uh, with um, whipworms, we also see a, a, a very good degree of preservation. But there are a lot of factors that come into that. So taphonomy plays a big role, and there's, you know, the, the type of the soil, the, um, the aridity of the climate, um, the nature in which these things were deposited, all of these things are taphonomic factors that go into parasite preservation. But the neat thing about this site where I'm doing my dissertation, this site in Mexico, is that um, all of the human remains that were excavated were found in a cave that um, is called La Cueva de los Huertos Chiquitos, um, so the Cave of the Dead Children. Yeah. And um, in this cave there were two areas that were sealed under a layer of adobe. So there was floor A and floor B, and um, when they pulled back these adobe floors, that's when they found um, a number of skeletons, most of which were children. I think there was one or two adults, and the rest were all children. Um, and um, it seems that they all died about the same time, so that the theory is that maybe there was some sort of epidemic that happened, and then they buried these children because they all died around the same time. Um, and there were also human remains, so there were quids and copper lights and, and lots of other things that were there. So the neat thing about this site is that all of that material was, was preserved under this layer of adobe, making the preservation just phenomenal. In fact, this is the best instances of parasite preservation in the world from this site. So it's very exciting to be working uh, with materials from this site. Um, which is another one of the reasons that we think it would be um, a good candidate for doing the ana analysis using ELISA. Because ELISA test kits have been used to analyze copper lights from other regions that didn't have such um, great uh, potential for preservation. And people have already done, uh, there was one study that has been done uh, looking at copper lights from this site, and the helmets that they found were just amazing. <laughs> they found, um, uh, let's see, they found hookworms, and they found whipworms, and they found a, just a ridiculously huge number of um, pinworm eggs, so Enterobius vermicularis. And the, the really interesting thing with pinworms is that I think 40% of the copper lights from the, that were tested, and there were about 36, 35, 36 copper lights tested from the site, um, and about 44% of them uh, tested positive for this pinworm. And with uh, populations today, if a person is in, or a population is infected with pinworms, only 5% of the population will actually pass eggs in their stool, which means that from this population, um, virtually everyone had to have been infected with pinworms. So this is a um, something that that comes into play for populations where overcrowding is an issue. And so they had you know all of these different parasites, especially these parasites that were um, indicative of of overcrowding and uh, living in unsanitary kinds of conditions where where transmission was was continuously happening. So this is a really cool site, and the the preservation is especially good here, which makes it just just perfect for doing sort of this this novel I, uh, novel sort of methodology for trying to understand the parasitism at this site. Uh, one last question. Okay. How about the level of risk of contamination from this same archaeological parasite? Like contamination, other other things getting in and, and contaminating my sample. No, uh, or, I'm talking about. You be contaminated by that. Oh, me getting like infected with a parasite. Yeah. <laughs> I get this question a lot, actually. Um, and this is much safer than any other sort of parasitological work you could do. Um, when I first started getting into this, I, I kind of had the same concern. Oh, could I get infected with these old parasites? But um, these parasites are long dead. I mean, these aren't anything that are infective anymore. I mean, some of these have been sitting there for, you know, 1300 years in the soil 
um, under layers of Adobe, so there's there's virtually no risk of, of being infected. Um, and, and most parasitologists have a much higher risk of occupational hazard of infection. Um, but lucky for me, I, I work with parasites that, that can't really hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, we have no risk of dying or being infected by, by these old parasites, mm -hmm. but there are other risks. Absolutely, there are definitely other risks. Um, some would argue more uh, terrifying risks, actually. Oh, so the the chemicals that we work with are very, very dangerous, and uh, some of them, you know, aren't too bad. Things like hydrochloric acid, things like hydrogen peroxide, but we also work with uh, things like zinc bromide, which is something we use to do um, heavy fractionation to be able to float the parasites up sometimes, and in particularly. Um, sandy kinds of sediments or sandy kinds of samples and with zinc bromide you have to be very careful and wear eye protection because that can cause you to go blind if you get it in your eyes so um, it could be very dangerous one time I was working with it and my eyes started hurting and I couldn't see and I thought oh oh my gosh I'm gonna go blind <laughs> and then I realized that I had worn my contacts for too long and they were just my contacts <laughs> were done so I hmm, everything's okay <laughs> um, but then we also work with um, uh, acetolysis solution when we do the pollen analysis, which is um, a 9 to 1 solution of acetic anhydride to um, sulfuric acid. So we do work with sulfuric acid, mm -hmm. which can be very, very dangerous. Yeah. Um, and when we do acetolysis, we have a, a special vent hood in our lab and everything that can um, keep us safe. And we wear gloves and eye protection and lab coats and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but the most dangerous thing we work with is hydrofluoric acid. And hydrofluoric acid is something we have to use when we have sam uh, samples that are particularly um, high in silicates. Um, and this can make it really hard to, um, to be able to find parasites or pollen or any of the things that we look for. So we use, but, but the nice thing about this um, particular acid is that it breaks down silicates, but it doesn't break down parasites and it doesn't break down starches and it doesn't break down um, pollen. So none of those things are, are affected by this acid, but this is a very, very strong acid. And when we use it, we have to use two sets of gloves, we have to have um, a lab coat with uh, sleeves going up through the wrist to where nothing, no skin is exposed, and we have to wear a lead apron and eye protection, and we work with the, uh, in our special vent hood in a positive pressure lab, and we also have the shield down when we're working with it so that we don't have stuff splashing up. Um, and the reason for this is because hydrofluoric acid is, is very, very dangerous, very toxic. And um, if you get it on your skin, if you get a little bit, you just need to wash it really fast and go to the hospital. Oh. Um, and they'll pump you full of um, injections to uh, slow down the, um, the ions that can get into your system. If you get too much on you and you don't get um, enough calcium into your system quick enough, it can stop your heart and kill you. Um, and there have been a number of people who... Uh, work with pollen, palynologists, who have died from hydrofluoric acid exposure because they weren't following proper safety protocols. And as long as you're careful and you're, you know, you're going through all of uh, the proper lab safety techniques, you're fine, um, but it is a, a risk. We have to keep a, a, a tube of calganate, which is a calcium type gel that will neutralize the fluoride, uh, fluorine ions if we were to get any on our skin and that would buy us enough time to get to the hospital for injections. Um, uh, anyway, so the, this can be very, very dangerous to work with. It can stop your heart. It's um, lots of people, or not lots of people, but a few people have died from it. Um, my professor is, is particularly good about making sure that we're being very careful when we're using it. Um, and when we use this, this acid, we only use it in the hood. We don't ever take it out. And between steps and using it, we have to count 20 seconds. So you pour a little bit of hydrofluoric acid in, you wait 20 seconds, and then you can mix it and you wait 20 seconds and then you can put it in the centrifuge and wait 20 seconds and then you can spin it. So we have to have this sort of latency between every um, step of the methodology and able to, and, and, uh, to enable us to uh, ensure that we're safe. Jonica, thank you very much for the interview again. Uh, my pleasure. I hope everyone understands the importance of archaeoparistology studies and how much more we can do about that. Oh yeah, lots of work that can be done and should be done and hopefully I get to do lots more of it.